I was out Daniel tonight. Yep. Yeah. Y'all may have been ready for that, but it's been good. Amen. So we're closing out Daniel, and then we're gonna start. We're gonna start moving to, in through the Book of Revelation. We'll see where next week goes. I might kind of do like a compare. We'll talk about. I don't know. I say we just go ahead and start with the churches. I, mean, I wasn't gonna teach on the churches, but why not? We'll just go ahead and cover it. I mean, you know, the first three chapters. But we'll go ahead and, and do that too. So we're gonna let's see. Let me go ahead and increase you right here. Give you where you can see. We're gonna read. This. Let's go ahead and just read. I tell you what. Let's read the whole chapter in unison because it's only a couple, about twelve verses, I think. Yeah. And then we'll go back and we'll start from. from this. Okay. It says, and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book of life. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness, as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, or two more, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And I mean, the description here is like two other angels or one of them. Many, I believe it sounds like it could be the Lord, which would be a Christophany and another angel. And one said to the man clothed in linen, that would be the Lord if this is a Christophany, which was upon the waters of the river. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was on the, upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto him. And swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the thousand. 335 days, but go your way to the end be, for you shall rest and stand in your lot at the end of the days. Father, we just ask you, Lord, for clarity and guidance, Lord, and wisdom. This passage of scripture, Lord, that ends this great book of Daniel, that you gave these visions and dreams and revelations to Daniel for the end. We just pray that you would help us to expose them and unfold them, Lord. Ultimately, I pray that you would give wisdom to your people, Lord, that are called by your name, that they would know what you desire to speak to them in these last days, Lord, that they would be prepared, yeah. Lord God, according to your will, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you go back and you look at the end of chapter 11, I'm not going to turn there, but it's talking about the Antichrist. We went through that big dissertation, and it was mostly focused on Antiochus, Epiphanes, Epiphanes, some people call him. He was a type of the Antichrist. We've already covered him in detail. We've mentioned his name so many times. You're probably getting tired of hearing it. But he was a type of the Antichrist. And ultimately in chapter 11, that's what it was descriptive of. It was descriptive of the end. It was descriptive of the Antichrist. So now transitioning to chapter 12, because there's not really chapter divisions in the Hebrew text. There's not really grammar. It's all flowing together. One, it would probably it'd be a scroll. You know, it wouldn't be like divided by chapters. 
And he says, and at that time. So essentially, he's saying at the time of the end, at the time that the Antichrist begins to cause his persecution and tribulation, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people. We, you know, we've already discussed, we've covered so much information. I'm going to just try to talk relatively freely with you guys because that's one of the reasons that I go through all the arduous process of paying attention to detail and breaking stuff down so that ultimately we can at some point in time just kind of speak fluently about the scripture. And we've already covered princes and arche and angels and whether they be even in the book of Daniel we talked about the prince of Grecia, the prince of Persia you remember that those were representative of fallen angels and then he also said in that chapter he said in Michael your prince talking about the fact that Michael is the is the angel of Israel which is the people of God and that all these other princes we would say seem to be maybe fallen angels we are kind of like Use, you know, we're kind of maybe, I don't want to say stretching, but the Bible's only mentioning three princes in the book of Daniel. Two of them are, are not godly because they're trying to fight against the will of God. And then one of them is Michael and he's godly. And so at that time, talking about in the end days, Michael, the prince of the children of Israel will stand up. And so this, it, there is definitely a, a, an, a, an allusion or an alluding to to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. So again, in the book of Daniel, we're approximately somewhere around 500 BC. But then in the book of Revelation, John the Beloved, when he writes it, is on the Isle of Patmos. He was imprisoned to the island of Patmos, and that's where he got the vision. And most scholars believe he wrote it down about AD 95. So we're looking at we're looking at, you know, 500, somewhere around 600 year difference. And the and John the Beloved is writing this revelate, the revelation of revelation, right? And, he, and, he, and he's talking about Michael the Prince. And he's saying, and, and as, uh, the best that I can see, I believe this to be a mid-trib sign. Or this revelation chapter 12 is taking place mid-trib wise, all right? Before I even get into this particular passage of scripture, I would just like to say that we've already talked a lot about the midpoint, and I'm going to go backwards a little bit and refresh your memory. In Daniel chapter 9, you remember that we talked about the fact that there's only one reference in the whole Bible to the last seven year period, the total seven years. You remember we've talked about that, and that multiple times in the New Testament, even in this chapter of Daniel, time, times in half. That's talking about three and a half years. Okay, that's one way to say three and a half years. All right, so multiple times in the Bible, it mentions three and a half years, but only one time in the Bible does it mention a seven year period. And that was in Daniel chapter nine. And what we learned in Daniel chapter nine was that last seven year period, as best we can determine, is beginning, begins with the stroke of a pen. Remember that? We said that there would be a covenant signed between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel, and that begins the prophetic time clock and starts that last seven year period because the angel told Daniel there are four, 77s determined upon your people. And when we multiply 70 times seven, we come up with 490 years. 483 years have been experienced. There's a last seven year period that is waiting. And it says after that covenant is signed, that begins that last seven year period. It specifically says in Daniel 9, in the middle of the seven years, he basically breaks the covenant. Now, we have all kinds of information in the New Testament. I'm just speaking to you freely about this. And, and all kinds of information about, a, about the middle of the tribulation. So what, what are we saying? We're saying that the prophetic time clock began with the writing of the sign or firming of the covenant. That, that can be taken a lot of different ways. I'm not trying to get caught up in minutia. But it could be that it's, that it's signed or it could be that it's a, a covenant that's already signed and then reaffirmed or confirmed. Then there's been many a covenant. There's a Balfour Declaration that's already been signed. There's an Abrahamic Accord that's already been signed. What I'm trying to say is, is that it may be a new covenant. We don't know. Or it could be a covenant that was already signed. Nevertheless, we're told in Daniel 9 that after it's already signed, in the midpoint, it's broken. 
And so whenever we take all this information in the New, in the New Testament, we add it to the Daniel chapter 9 passage, and we're looking at this Revelation chapter 12 that I'm about to read to you, that in that time, your Prince Michael will stand up. What we're about to read in Revelation chapter 12 is something that's taking place in heaven. And then there's things that are taking place on earth. And what I want you to know is, is that I believe that all this is coinciding at the same time. What I'm trying to say is, is that when the seven year period is starts with this covenant sign, that in the middle point, there's going to be stuff going on in heaven, what we're about to read. And it says that Satan is going, we're about to read it, but it says Satan is going to try almost like I would call it a spiritual coup de gras. He's going to try one last time. It says in the book of Ezekiel, I will rise myself above the throne of the Most High. I will exalt myself in the temple. And guess what Jesus said? I saw Satan cast to the ground like light. He tried to elevate himself. Boom. Cast like lightning to the ground. But, as we're about to read, he still had some limited access to heaven. Through the years. Why? Because this passage of scripture is going to tell us that he's the accuser of the brethren. We learn in the book of Job that he accused Job. So the, so the enemy of your soul is constantly trying to go towards to, in the presence of God and accuse you. Whoever you is, all of us, personal pronoun, he's trying to accuse you. What did you do wrong last week? What did you do wrong last month? I can tell you the enemy is going before the Lord and he's saying, look at this one. They call themselves Christian, which means Christ-like, and look at this one. Look what they're doing. I'm here to tell you tonight, this isn't in my notes, the Word of God says that when you put faith in Jesus Christ and what He did for you at the cross, that you are now justified according to Romans chapter 4. That means that you are judged based on the righteousness of Jesus. You've been covered with the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And when the Father sees you, He doesn't see your faults and your guilt. Now that doesn't give you permission to just go have a sin fest. But He doesn't see your faults and your guilt. And the enemy is trying to accuse you before your father day and night. He's trying to make you feel condemned and guilty. And anybody that lives under condemnation and guilt cannot truly be free to be a witness for the Lord. Because you don't feel worthy. And I'm here to tell you right now, God does not want you living under condemnation and guilt. He wants you free by the blood of the Lamb. So that you can express what God has done in your life. Amen? That's just the word of God, right? All right. So, so again, the enemy is going to go up there. The final coup de grace, something in the spiritual realm is going to happen. There's going to be a war in heaven like we're going to read in a second. And he's going to be cast down for the final. He won't be able to go back up and accuse you anymore. All this stuff. Hallelujah. All that stuff is going to be happening at the same time. When he comes down onto the earth, it says, But woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for he comes down to you with great wrath. And I believe it's when he comes down, and that I can't prove it, but this is what I believe. When he's cast down for final is when he's going to possess the Antichrist. And that's going to begin that midpoint where 2 Thessalonians, he's going he's gonna to exalt himself in the wing of the temple. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, when you, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee to the mountains. All of these things. See, that's why all the scriptures got to come together. You can't just take this scripture over here. No, if it's not congruent throughout, then you can't come up with some kind of theological concept that does not take all of the scriptures into account. And so all of this stuff is happening. I believe this to be mid-trip point. And where we're going off of Revelation chapter 12, verse, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time, what time? The time that the Antichrist begins to persecute because that's what chapter 11 of Daniel was speaking of at that time Michael the great prince will stand up here we go now we've moved to Revelation chapter 12 we're going to read it and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not hallelujah good news good news the devil might be tough he might be bad he might have caused us some trouble but guess what he doesn't win in the end my friend 
And that's one thing that you can hold on to. The word of God says, and listen, I've experienced enough victory. Listen, I got a long way to go. But I guarantee you, I have experienced some victories in my life, spiritually speaking, that I know that I know, like Sister Ted used to say. I know that I know that I know that I know that he's real, and I know that he's got more power than the devil. I know he's got more power than that lion slew foot. I know that my Jesus won the victory. I know that if I'll keep my faith in him, then the Holy Spirit will give me the victory. I might not have it today, but listen, that's why Paul said, fight the good fight of Amen. He never told you to struggle against sin, Christian. He said, fight the good fight of faith. And when grace is released, it will give you the strength Hallelujah. that you need to overcome. To be Amen. an overcome. Right. Amen. He's made, you're more than a conqueror. Amen. All right. He says, and he prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. That's what I was trying to tell you. He's no longer welcome. Right now, today, he can present himself when God tells him to, just like in the book of Job. In the book of Job, he says, where you been, Satan? Yeah. He says, I'm walking to and fro and up and down. And so you don't know really what's going on, but it seems like Satan's accusing all kinds of people because the next thing God says in Job, he says, but have you considered my servant Job? See? And so what we see from that discourse is that the enemy of our soul is going and he's presenting himself before God and he's accusing us. And look what it says right here, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, look at this, which accused them before our God day and night. And look what it says right here. I don't know. You know, look, you can pre-trib, mid-trib, whatever you want to be. But somebody, this is what this is talking about right here. Somebody is going to have to overcome this enemy. And look how they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, yes, by the word of their testimony. Look at this. Yes. And they loved not their lives yes. unto death. Anybody want to die tonight? No. I'm not looking forward to death. I'm definitely not looking forward, forward to the pain of death. I look forward to being in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be honest with you. Every day I wake up, this place is a little less appealing. I'm just being real. Yeah. I, 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 you know, the word, the, worse, the worser it gets, the less I like it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the same time, I ain't looking to go out and jump in front of a train. I'm going to let the Lord do, take his course. Amen. I'm not looking to die. And I definitely ain't looking forward to the pain of death. But I, can I tell you? Can I tell you that the Lord will give you the strength that you need in order to endure? He's done it for too many people in the past not to still do it for you. Amen. But you are but you got to solidify in your heart and your mind that there's nothing more important in your life or on this earth more important than Jesus. There's nothing more important, amen, than serving. I mean, do you either believe it or you don't? And it's okay if you're not there yet, wherever you might be, whoever you might be. If you're not there yet, but you love the Lord and there is a true place in your heart for Jesus, listen, the Lord has a way of convincing you of that. Amen. Because there was a time in my early Christianity, I can't say that. I kind of still love this old world, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's normal for that love for this world to slowly start to die. All right. They love not their lives unto death. All right. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens. I'm just trying to give you the whole picture of this passage because it is very uh, congruent or relevant for the Daniel passage. Rejoice ye heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, which is Israel, that brought forth the man child. All right, let's go back to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Remember it says, and at that time shall Michael stand up. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I believe that Revelation passage we just read is correlating with this. Does that make sense? All right. The great prince which stands for the children of your people, there shall be a time of trouble 
uh, just what we just explained or described, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. And he goes on to say this. He says, everyone that shall be found written in the book. You see that? Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And I know most of you know this, but I figured I'd go ahead and go there. That you do know there's a book, right? There's books in heaven. And one of them is called the book of life. Uh, it's also referred to as the Lamb's book of life. Amen. That means that uh, now is there a literal book? I don't know. I'm just telling you how the Bible describes it. That there's a book and there's people's names that are written in the book. And people's names that are written in the book are those that were saved. Those that put their faith in Christ. And it says, and there shall no wise enter into it, talking about in heaven, that defiles, neither whatsoever that works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so what, you know, what, Dan, what the Lord is, is saying about this Daniel passage is that in that day, there's going to be the children of Daniel, those that are written in the Lamb's book of life, those, those Jews. You, listen, there's a pr prominent preacher that's out of uh, San Antonio, Texas, and he would say that, there, that the Jews had a different form of salvation. They had a different way. They had a different covenant. No, 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 no. That's not what the book of Ephesians says. The book of Ephesians says that he made two men one. And how did he do it? Through the blood of Jesus. And so listen, in the end, the Jews are going to, those that are going to be saved and delivered are going to be those that have put their faith in Christ. That's right. Amen. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting life. Now, what I want you to, to know is, and maybe some of you have tried to study this, but the idea behind here, there's a thousand years that separates these two. Mm -hmm. So where it says right here that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken. Some will awaken to life. That's the resurrection. Man. All right. You get that? The rapture or the resurrection. That's right. Okay. Jesus was the first fruit. Meaning that he already resurrected. Amen. And when the rapture happens, it was to say in the book of Thessalonians, it says with the shout of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Rapture, resurrection is synonymous. The, the, those that are buried or sleep in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. There we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Okay, so the idea is, is that some, on that day, those that sleep in the dust, I'm talking about dead folk that are buried in the ground, uh, shall awake. Some are going to awake to everlasting life, the first, re the resurrection, the rapture of the church, but some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, I'm not going to go there because we need to save some time, but I'm letting you know that there's scripture that talks about the great white throne judgment which takes place after the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And so what that means is, is that those that are buried, that died outside of Christ, their spirit man is down there being tormented, wherever there is. I'm not going to get into all that, it's deep, but I've taught it before. But, but the actual lake of fire is until later. Okay. Right now, though, people are still being tormented. Their soul, their spirit man, at least according to the Bible, Jesus said the worm doesn't die there. And wherever this place is right now, Lazarus is Lazarus the beggar, the rich man was there. He was being tormented. Okay. And, and, and after this thousand years, though, just like just like those that die in Christ, I don't know how, how God does it, but he created Adams the way that they are. And whenever the resurrection happens, and ba -ba -ba, the, horn, the, the shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God blows. All those atoms that are in the dust are going to coalesce and they're going to come back together. And we're going to physically be resurrected. Does that make sense? I mean, when you die today, your spirit goes to be with the Lord. But then on that day, the dead in Christ will rise and we're going to receive a glorified body. But there's a whole thousand years that takes place. And somehow, some way, those physically, spiritually dead people are going to rise too and they're going to have to give an account
for their decision to reject the Lord. There's a thousand years that separates these two concepts right here. All right. They that be wise, though, look at this, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I just wanted to take at least a moment. I don't know. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and turn here because to me, I always this is listen, I'm, I'm kind of like shifting gears a little bit. But what it was talking about right there in that Daniel passage was even during these time frames of all this turmoil and chaos and this what I believe to be a mid trip event whenever the Antichrist is causing all this persecution and Michael, the, your prince stands up and your people, you know, all of this stuff going on. He says that those that are wise, those that lead souls, those that reach out, they're going to shine bright. Amen. And you know what? And you're supposed to, you and I are supposed to be shining bright right now. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I've always tried to teach this concept for those of you that, you know, when we talk about Pentecost, the spirit of Pentecost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I want you, you know, I want you to understand to me, these things are, I just love these concepts, but I guess it's because I'm a teacher and I mean, maybe it bores you. I don't know, but the spirit of prophecy. You understand that God has always had a witness in the land. He wants people to know about him. And you know, there's a scripture in Genesis chapter four, whenever he's talking to Cain, remember that he said, the blood, the righteous blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. I just need you to know that there's not one drop of righteous blood that's spilt upon the earth that God, the father does not see. And that God has always had a witness on the earth, starting with Abel. Obviously, Cain didn't like his witness. I don't want to break that down because we could be here forever. But obviously, Cain didn't like Abel's witness, and he killed him. But look, think about Enoch. Think about Noah, a preacher of righteousness in the times of darkness. Think about the nation of Israel. They were, they were supposed to be a light in the midst of darkness. And then we transition forward to the years of all the prophets. God's always had a voice in the land. And then the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit would fall upon all those that were present. And Pentecost is still available for people today to be filled with the Holy Ghost so that they could be witnesses for the Lord. But look, I want you to know something. This isn't something that just showed up in a back room somewhere. God always planned to fill people up with the Spirit of God. Look at Numbers. This is Numbers chapter 11, verse 26. This is talking about a time frame, you know, after the exodus and the children of Israel are wandering. Look what it says. There remain two of the men in, in the camp. So we're talking about the camp of Israel after the exodus. And they're, they're following the, 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 the cloud by day and the, and the fire by night. Y'all remember the story. The Lord's leading and guiding them in the exodus. And there's two men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the other one was Medad. That's some funny names. Maybe they were twins. And the spirit rested upon them. I want you to see that. And they were of them that were written, but went not out into the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. Now you let that sound like a little tattletale. Doesn't it? Oh, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And look at Joshua. Joshua Yeshua is what his name means in the Hebrew, which is the type of Christ. But look right here, he's kind of carnal. <laughs> Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Stop them. In other words, don't let them prophesy. That's your job, Moses. Wow. You're the one that's supposed to speak. Look what Moses said. Oh, this is the spirit of prophecy right here, my friend. This is the spirit of Pentecost right here. This is the heart of the Lord. I want you to understand this. Moses said unto him, envy thou for my sake. In other words, you're getting all envious for me because somebody else is prophesying for the Lord. He said, I would or would, which means I wish that God, all God's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon all of them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
What I need you to know is, is that even in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, during the Exodus event, whenever they were following the cloud by day and the fire by night, the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophet Moses, Oh, I would that the Lord would put his spirit on all men and that they would all prophesy. I just want you to know, we're going back to Daniel 12 in a second, that during that time frame of trial and tribulation, during that mid-trip event, I believe that to be the case. Even right now, it's so important that you and I would be filled with the Holy Ghost. There's people out there, that, listen, there's people out there that don't know the Lord. There's people out there that are dying in their sin. It's either real or it's not. I'm convinced it's real. I'm convinced that the Lord wants you and I to be witnesses for him. Yes. Look, you, if you don't feel like you're a witness for the Lord, pray. Say, Lord, fill me up with your spirit and make me hungry to be a witness for you. Yes. You see the will of the Lord right here. Yes. That the spirit of God wow. would, would be upon all God's people. And that they would all be witnesses and prophets for him. Amen. Listen, you know, sometimes people think... Oh, well, uh, prophets foretell the future. You know what I used to like what Brother Swagger would say? Prophets don't, prophecy is not just the foretelling of the future. Prophecy is the foretelling. Meaning, you tell the truth of the gospel. That's what a prophet is to do, is to tell the truth of the gospel. Yes, sometimes God will give us a, a gift of prophecy or a word of prophecy. Amen? And sometimes the Lord will give us a word of knowledge. And sometimes we, and I know that he's used me a couple of times that way, but guess what? The mouth of the prophet, if you study the mouth of the prophet in the times of Israel, you know what he did? He told the truth. He told the truth in the midst of an evil generation. We, you and I live in the midst of an evil generation. We need the voice of the prophet to speak the truth. Amen. And they, that, and, and listen, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That's what God's saying. Listen, whether it's now, whether it's then, those that turn others to the Lord will, will shine like the stars. Amen. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. You know, whenever we read the book of Daniel, I'm, I know I've shared this with you before. I've, I've studied Daniel many times. I've taught Daniel many times. I can honestly tell you right now. I don't know that I did a very good job of explaining it to you, but I can tell you one thing. I understand the book of Daniel so much better today than I did even last year. Amen. And what this scripture is talking about is, is as time moves forward. Listen, when Daniel wrote the pen, pit, the Lord gave him this, he, he didn't know what all this meant. He had some understanding of it, but he straight up in this chapter, he asked God, reveal it to me. And the Lord told him, seal it up. It's not time yet. And as time has moved forward, as history has taken place, God has allowed us all as humans to understand a little bit better about what these were saying. This was saying. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two or two more, one on this side of the bank of the river, the other on that side. One said to the man clothed in linen. And essentially, again, the idea here is that it could be two angels. Every now and then you run into, this is, opi this is opinion, there's no way to prove it, okay? And so whenever I know that there's no way to prove it, I always let you, now there's, there's some commentators that will probably say, this is the Lord Jesus, but I don't have any way to prove that to you. So what I'll say is, when I read this, I believe that this is a Christophany. That's a big old fancy word. For meaning that there's times in the Old Testament that it certainly seems that Jesus showed up in the Old Testament. And whenever you hear this terminology about him being clothed in linen, it's reminiscent of the book of Revelation. And it makes me think that this could be a Christophany. Now, maybe you don't think this deep. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't even say it. Maybe I just mess people up. But many times in the Old Testament, just in case you ever run against across it in the future as you're studying, many times in the Old Testament, it describes these Christophanies as though it were an angel of the Lord. And then you get the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? <laughs> and they'll say, Jesus was an angel. But can I tell you that in the Old Testament, there's no, well, first of all, there's no place 
As a matter of fact, there's New Testament scripture that states that Jesus didn't come to die for angels. He came to die for the seed of Abraham. Right. All right. Number two, they say that the only reason I'm bringing it up is so that if you ever run across it in the future, that you won't be thinking that Jesus is an angel. Okay. There, and there's other places. So what, what it says, though, is that there's many places where it describes, even, even whenever Jacob wrestled with the Lord, there's other spots that says it was an angel. So in the Old Testament, I need you to understand, and even in the New Testament, the word angel itself can either describe, sometimes it's translated as angel, but it can be a, a man, a messenger, or an angel. All I'm trying to tell you is, is that Jesus is not an angel. All right? So the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which I believe is a Christophany of Jesus, which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that lives forever that it shall, look at this, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. So I'm just trying to reiterate, I'm repetitive, but I'm trying to get this stuff in your spirit, man. That when it says time, times, and a half, a time is a year, times is two years, so now we got three, and a half is 3.5. Three and a half years. Again, this is all relevant because when we get to the book of Revelation, we realize that there's not a spot that talks about seven years. The only spot is in Daniel 7 and that the first three and a half years is, I would call it faux peace. F-A-U-X. Faux. Fake. It's fake peace. It's not real peace. And, and you know, some people would say, well, dude, we already got wars and rumors of wars. Danielle told me the other day, they got all kinds of ships out that are just sitting out on the outskirts of, of America. I mean, I don't know. I don't watch the news anymore, and I don't really care to. But supposedly, every now and then on the news, I guess they show it. Those of you that watch the news, can you verify? Some people are shaking their head. They got all kinds of ships out there in the water that are full of delivery that's supposed to be coming to the United States of America. Full of food, full of supplies, and they've just been sitting out there. Why are they sitting? I don't know. Is it because there's a COVID pandemic that now I'm not trying to make fun. The Lord knows they're about to shoot another bullet. We'll have an Epsilon before you know it. But nevertheless, there's all these ships out there. Delta, Epsilon is the next Greek letter after <laughs> Delta. Another variant. All right. So there's all these ships out there, all right, in the water. And they're not allowing them to come to harbor. So, so the point that I'm trying to make is this. That's the black horse monster. Could be. Okay. But what I'm trying to tell you is the white horse hasn't shown up yet. So it can't be the legit black horse. Right. Okay. All that stuff, the white horse comes first. That's the Antichrist. Okay. Then the red horse, wars and rumors of war. Then the black horse, famine. Then the horse of death. But my point is, is that all this stuff can be taking place and in preparation for famine, but until the white horse shows up, we ain't in the legit beginning of the seven-year period. Does that make sense? Right. But, but one of the things that I've been trying to explain for a long time, though, is that, and, you know, Rob, we had some good conversation that night. We talked about it, and Robert brought it up, that, and, I, and I agree 100%. It could be the Lord causing famine and, and allowing war as chastisement and to prepare the earth. But what, but what, what I wanted to make, the point I want to make is, is that man can cause war and famine. Who's making the decision to tell these ships not to come into harbor? You understand what I'm saying? Somebody somewhere, I, again, I'm not trying to make a bigger deal about it. I haven't even seen it on the news. I'm going based off of secondhand information. Somebody, if these ships are not coming into harbor, is saying, halt, don't come into harbor. Sit out there in the middle of the sea, drop your anchors, and just sit there. Who's doing that? It's not, it's, it, it's a, Ultimately, it's a human being that's, that's giving the order. That's the point that I'm trying to make. All these things, wars, famine, pestilences. Okay, we had, let the Lord help me. We're going to go to that next week maybe or some, sooner or later we'll get there. About the four horses. We're not there right now. But what, what I'm trying to say is times, times, and half a time that once this Treaty is broken in the mid seven year point, 3.5 years. The first three and a half years 
our fake peace. And it begins with the signing of the covenant, but I believe that that coincides with the white horse, which is when the Antichrist first shows up. And then in the middle, I got enough scripture to back it up, is when he causes the abomination that causes desolation. He demands to be worshipped. He exalts himself in the temple of God. You understand what I'm saying? All these things are mid-trib. So for that first three and a half years, the book of Revelation isn't even going to talk about that. It's talking about the last three and a half years most of the time. Because that's the last three and a half years that he's given to reign over the earth. Yes, sir. Yeah. How does Jesus ministry for three and a half years? That's, that's some good stuff I was about yeah. to say. So isn't that interesting? That Jesus' yeah. ministry was for three and a half years. And then the Antichrist, we're told, three and a half years. And, you know, everything that the, everything the devil does, he wants to counterfeit. He wants glory. He wants honor. He wants to be exalted. And so, you know, some people have said he demands his three and a half years. I mean, God ain't, God don't owe him nothing. But at the same time, God allows these things. We've got to remember that, that God is allowing these things to happen. And part of it is explained in 2 Thessalonians 2. Why does he allow it to happen? Because people didn't want the truth. That's what he says. People didn't want the truth, and so therefore he allowed them to believe a lot. <clears throat> but that's good. I was about to say that. Isn't that interesting? Jesus ministered for three and a half years, and then the Bible talks about the Antichrist for time, times, and half. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I... Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? You know, I just thought about this earlier when we read this through. I'm about to close. But when we read this through, I was thinking, because you see Daniel right here in verse 8. Look what he's saying. And I heard, but I understood not. I heard all this stuff God was saying, but I didn't completely understand. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel. <laughs> Think about that. Wait, what was I saying? If y'all don't remember, I mean, I remember maybe vividly because I've been reading it, listening to it, and preaching it. But if you would remember all the chapters, there were places where Daniel said, I was a stony. I, I fell to the ground. I was troubled in my spirit. I saw all of these things, I, I, you know, and over and over again. And God's revealing all of this stuff to him. So I'm thinking, Daniel, you are the beloved of the Lord. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? You Look, in the beginning, you didn't eat the king's meat. You didn't drink the king's wine. Look at all this. I chose you, Daniel. I, you, you saw that. You, you got to interpret the dreams. You saw all of this stuff. And so I'm thinking at this point in time, Daniel's feeling, I mean, forgive me for saying it like this. I'm thinking he's feeling pretty tight with the Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, God has shown him all of this stuff. And then Daniel says, oh, my Lord. What shall be the end of these things? And the Lord says, go your way, Daniel. Think about that. I mean, I'm not trying to make too big of a deal about it, but sometimes we demand answers from the Lord. Huh? Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I'm preaching the truth now. We demand an answer from the Lord. Lord, give me this answer. You know, Lord, why haven't I gotten this answer? Go your way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Meaning this was in Daniel's personal life, but in our personal life. Sometimes we're looking for answers from the Lord, right? Yeah. And it's not that the Lord doesn't want to give us the answers, but it's not God's timing to give us the answers. And just the same thing that he asked from Daniel, I know for a fact he would ask from us. What is that? Just be faithful. Yeah. Just be faithful and serve me. And guess what? When it's the timing to give you the answer, I'll give you the answer. But in the meantime, just trust me and serve. Amen? Amen? Look at this, though, in verse 10. He says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So again, we're talking about at the end, whoever you want to say these many are, depending upon your position on the rapture, it's saying, though, during this tribulation time, that many shall be purified. I'm just going to go ahead and speak it out because this is kind of like part of my opinion about this whole mid, 
whatever you want to call it, mid-trib pre-wrath position, why would God allow the church to go through this? Okay, and that's a good question. That's a, because it says it's for the children of Israel, but it doesn't ever anywhere say that the church couldn't be involved in that. So why would God allow the church to go through some of this right here? Many shall be purified and made white and tried to be put to the test. What I'm trying to make a point is, is this, is that there's much of the church that calls itself church that may not really be the church. That's right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And to be fair to those people, come on now, hold on a second. Let's not get self-righteous. Because to be fair, to, and I was actually praying it in the prayer room before we came out here. There's many people that are sitting in churches that love the Lord, mm -hmm. right? They love the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives in their heart. Mm -hmm. And they're, can I just say it like this? They're collateral damage. And what I mean by that is, They've been sitting under a preacher that's preaching false doctrine. Right. I'm going to tell you right now, that's, that's some legit stuff, my friend. There's a whole lot less people out there that truly understand the gospel for the way it's written and what we give credit for. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have been besotted or drunken by a false doctrine. There's nothing more than the enemy would like is to cause people to be drunk under a spirit of false doctrine. Why? So that they cannot function the way that they're supposed to function. So what is your point, preacher? My point is, that's actually mercy from God. If, I'm just saying, if the church, if the rapture doesn't take place, and I'm about to show you some numbers real quick and we're going to close. If the church has to experience it, you may not see it like that, but I see that as mercy. Yeah. Because it gives people the opportunity. Now, you don't want it. I don't want it. Who wants that? I don't want to go through that. But what about, but, but are we selfish in our, and I'm not saying that we are. I'm just saying it's a different way to, to view it. Are we selfish and we just, I just want to get out of here, Lord. I do too. Yeah. I told you already. I, I'd rather go home and be with the Lord tomorrow. But if God is being merciful and there's many people that don't really know him. Amen. Many, all I can tell you is, whoever the many are, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. In other words, they ain't going to be changed. No matter how bad times get, no matter what people go, yes, sir? Could that uh, refer to salvation in their lives? I believe it could. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It could refer to salvation. Absolutely. He says, that, but none of the wicked shall understand because you know why they don't want to understand right the wicked don't really want the truth but the wise shall understand i'm not going to turn there but revelation chapter 13 says let him who has wisdom understand the mark of the beast 666 i believe that there could be some kind of connection because what i believe what he's saying here look at this the wicked shall do wickedly none of the wicked shall understand in other words okay let's just I'm not trying to overdo this, but let's say we believe, let's say we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So the Lord takes the church, and for the next three and a half years, there's people on the earth that don't know the Lord, and like Robert said, they're getting saved. Okay. Um, the, the people that are wise are going to understand what's going on. If it's not a pre-tribulation rapture, then the, then the people that are wise are going to understand what's going on. Right. The, the, the Lord, by His grace and through His Spirit, is going to allow people to be able to see something is going on. Something is awry. Something's not right. Who is this man that rises up? Who is this man? You see what I'm trying to get at? And so that's why I believe that there's a connection to that 666. Let him that has wisdom understand. But the people that are wicked and don't know the don't even want to know the truth are not going to understand and they're just going to remain blind, right? Now, now this is the part that I want you to see these two numbers right here, and then I'm going to show you a graph, <laughs> and then I'm going to close out. I just and listen, I, I I already believed this way before I ever found this graph. I think that this graph is it does kind of like graph numbers out the way that I was already seeing it, but sometimes being able to see a picture. It allows you to see. So look, from that, 
and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. All right, so look, and the abomination that makes desolate set up. So what is that talking about? That what is the what is the daily sacrifice taken away and the abomination that causes desolation? What is that? Huh? That's when he sits in the temple. That's when he sits in the temple. So we've already said, I've, I've, at least I've tried to establish, that this last seven-year period starts when the covenant is signed and that he, he puts himself in the temple at the midpoint, right? So it says right here, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and then he, talking about the Antichrist, sets himself up, it says there shall be... 1,290 days. Okay, so, huh? Did somebody say something? You did, what'd you say? You did, you said something. <laughs> she don't want to say it, but she said something. Now look at this. Now it's giving you another number. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the, the 1,335. All right, now I want to show you. So we're, we're, we're talking about 1,290 days, right? What, and what, because look, let me just say this. 1,260 days according, I know that this is confusing. I'm gonna, we're going to close with a graph here in a second, but I just want to get some basic information. 1,260 days is how long? It's three and a half years, according to a Jewish lunar calendar. And we're talking about Jewish. 1,260 days. In a 30, in a lunar month, it which is 30 days, it's three and a half years. All right? So 1,290, so now, now I'm going to show you 1,290 days, and then the other one is 13, 1,335. Is it right? 35 days, right? 1,335 days. All right. Blessed is he that waits for the 1,000. 335 days. What she's gonna say? I think it's a, uh, I think it's a 75 day book. Okay, so look at this. Well, maybe 70. So, so take. What was it? One 1,390. 1,335. Yeah. Minus 1290. No, minus do 1260. Is what? 60 is Should be 75. Yeah. Huh? All right. So look. The uh, 75 days between yes. the end of the tribulation and the full blessing of blessing. Okay. So look. Yeah. So look at, let's look at this. Y'all ready? Yeah. So right here. You see that little? You probably can't even see that. You probably can't see none of this. It says, this graph says, Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for one week. That's Daniel chapter 9 that we've already covered. That starts the seven-year period. So this whole graph is actually showing a seven-year period, right? So look, it says right here that the abomination that causes desolation. Now, the way this guy writes it, again, whether you agree or not, I'm just saying. The way this guy writes it is he's got the sixth seal, the rapture, okay? That's right. All of this is taking place. He's got it taking place 75 days after the abomination that causes desolation. So what I want you, but what I want you to see is on the first thing he said, he said, from the day that the sacrifice is ended until and and the abomination that causes desolation would be 1290 days. You probably can't see it, but you see this bottom, this bottom graph right here. Right. This one right here to the right says 1290 days. So check this out. So, from the midpoint until the end, so when the daily sacrifice is ended and the abomination that causes desolation, then there will be 1,290 days. So, what, that, what that's saying, what, what, this is the way he's interpreting that, okay? So, you see how he drew that line? 1,290 days from the, from the midpoint till the end, all right? But then he says, but then Daniel says, blessed is he that makes it, or we can go back and look and see exactly what he said. Blessed is he that endures, waits, what does it say? 
until the 1335 days. So look what he, this is the way this dude drew this. 1335 days from the confirmation of the covenant. That's this line down here. I know it's hard to see. Okay. Oh, he's talking about those who make it to the tribulation. Yes, to the rapture. To the rapture. Ah, Blessed is he. That's at least what it looks like in Daniel. What, now Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1335 days, which is 75 days after the rapture, according to this. So therefore, the great tribulation would be 75 days if you hold to this kind of thinking. Now, again, can I prove to you that that's what Daniel's talking about? But I will say, what does he mean? What does Daniel mean right there? Somebody read it to me, Mike. Read it out loud. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty five. Blessed is he that waits and comes until the thirteen hundred and thirty five days. Blessed is he who makes a rapture. In other words. If if that's the interpretation. Yeah. That's nice. Blessed is he. Whereas the other one is twelve hundred and ninety days from the beginning to the end. So those of you that love numbers. And we're always wondering, there you go. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say that that's the definite, but that's what I'm trying to say in here. Follow, yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I know the church teaches pre trib rapture, uh -huh. and then it'll be seven years of tribulation. They call it great. And, and we're talking wrath, God, you know, tribulation and wrath of God, two separate things. Yes. Uh, in the rapture in the middle. Now, when, when the Antichrist comes in and signs his treaty, What's going to happen to the people who've been waiting on a pre-trib rapture? How are their mindsets going to be when they see all this happening? What are people, are they going to fall away? Okay, well, or first of all, I mean, know? that's what, first of all, before I even understood, before I even understood where to put all this timing, I wrote that book how long. And before I, basic, long story short, I believe pandemonium. I believe sheer Pandemonium. Now, panic, fear, anger, bitterness, frustration. Okay, now, let me just say this. In the very beginning, nobody's really going to know anything right away. I mean, we might know because we're kind of looking for it. That's why I always said, to, and listen, I want to be careful when I say this, but that's why, listen, I don't think that, that's, that Trump was that, but I'll keep bringing it up. Because I voted for Trump. I mean, are you supposed to not say that from behind a pulpit? I'm not trying to endorse a political candidate. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to tell you what I did. I voted for the man that said he wasn't going to play games with China anymore. But as a believer that studied the Bible, all I'm trying to say is when I heard that him and Jared went over there and signed that covenant, my bell started ringing. I'm not trying to say that that was that. But we should be aware anytime anything like that happens, because that don't happen every day, my friend, that people sign peace agreements with Israel. And the scripture talks about it in Daniel chapter 9. Again, I'm not trying to say that that's what that was. All I'm trying to say is, is that if we've been studying the Bible, our, our spiritual alarm should be going off. Yeah. And, and I, I'm going to say it, Lord forgive me, because I'm trying to poke nobody in the eye. Instead of, he's coming back in August, he's coming back in September, he's coming back in November, he's coming back in December, he's going to save us. No, he's not. Jesus is going to save Amen. the church. Amen. Okay? And we got to be careful. Now, do I like his political viewpoint? Yeah, I do. But Lord, let me stop it. I get my 501c3 <laughs> taken away that I don't even have. I never signed up for that, so there you go. Father, we thank you and praise you and give you glory and honor. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord God, because we know that you got it in your word, Lord, and we're just trying to be good students of your word. Lord, I pray, pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, for the truth, Lord, and that Bridget brought up, Lord, what would happen to the people that were expecting things to happen a certain way and were never expecting to have to endure anything. Lord, you never promised us an American gospel. You just didn't. Lord, many of your people called by your name have suffered persecution and great harm through the years. And you've always been there to help them, Lord. I believe this, that the concern is, is that if it does go down this way, that the answer to her question is sheer panic, pandemonium, and even bitterness and anger towards God because it didn't happen the way they always expected. 
But I pray, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would prepare those. The, Lord, the Word of God says that the Lord knows how to save those that are His. Lord God, we know that we just desire to be yours. We know that we desire to serve you. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you would minister to each and every one of our hearts and that you would just prepare us, Lord. Yeah. Prepare us, oh Lord God, for whatever it is that we must face. Yeah. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Good word. Good questions.